Welcome to the second video on replicated event sourcing. In the first video, we looked at the motivations behind this new feature and how it works. In this video, we're going to look at how we data model for when we have multiple instances of each of our entities in an ACA cluster. Let's remind ourselves what happens when we start to replicate our event source behaviors. We can run them per data center, per role, or ad hocly, however you wish to start them. When events are persisted by one replica, they're automatically replicated to the other. A lot of the time, the events persisted by each of the replicas will not happen concurrently. And in that case, your event handler, the business logic for your event source behavior will be just like a normal event source behavior. However, when things happen concurrently, we need to use different data modeling techniques to make sure that we have a consistent system. Under the covers, Aka keeps track of when this happens via a version vector. So inside your business logic, you know whether an event has happened concurrently or not. A recognized way to model these type of conflicts, but still end up with an eventually consistent system is to use a conflict-free replicated data type or a CRDT. These are data types where this final state converges. Let's take an addition as an example. If we were to add the numbers four, three, and five, we would get 12. However, if these operations were to happen in a different order, we end up with the same result. Just because a data model is convergent doesn't mean it's always consistent. After the first operation on the left, we end up with seven, four plus three. After the first operation on the right, we end up with nine, five plus four. What these data types give us is eventual consistency. Each replica doing the computation will eventually end up with the same result. So let's see this modeled as an event source behavior with multiple replicas. The way we end up with different orderings is because the origin of the events will be from different replicas. So on the left here in EU West 2, we add four and we add three, and we end up with a, a state of seven. But on the right in EU West 1, it first adds five and then receives the four. And for a while, the two sides are inconsistent. But by the end, once all of the events are replicated, we end up with a consistent state. These types of data models still work in the event of network partitions or events being delayed. Imagine the network was cut between the two data centers. That means that EU West 2 would only, for quite some time, see plus 4 and plus 3, whereas EU West 1 would only see its own event plus 5. Once the network partition is healed, all of the events will get replicated and we'd end up with a consistent state on both sides. To implement this convergent data type, we're replicating the operations rather than the state, which is very natural for building event source systems. It's the fact that the operations have been replicated, meaning that each side can apply them and end up with the correct result. Now, of course, all operations aren't as simple as addition. So let's have a look at a set. If we were to model the operations of a set as events, they wouldn't by default be convergent because the order in which you add and remove things will dictate the final state. Imagine on one side, we add four, on the other side, we remove four. If we add and then remove or remove and then add, we end up with a different state for a set. However, there's a whole host of common data structures which have CIDT properties one of which is an all set, which is an observed removed set. When applying the events of add and remove, rather than just store which members there are in the set, it also stores how many times they've been added and removed. To see if a member is in a set, then the number of adds needs to exceed the number of removes. The notation here is a minus for a remove and a plus for an add. And because of the rules of an all set, if we have equal numbers of adds and removes, then the element is not in the set. This is the movie watch list, which is included as part of ACA samples. In this sample, it demonstrates how to use a built-in CRDT as the state of your event source behavior. So normally, when you define an event source behavior, you define three types. The commands that are sent to your event source behavior, the events which are persisted, and then the final state which is reconstructed from those persisted events. In this example, we only define the command and those commands are add movie, remove movie, and get movie list. The get movie list pass, passes in an actor reference 
of type movie list, which is the response. The reason we only need to include the command type is we're going to use a built-in CRDT as our state. So here with the event source behavior, the order of the type parameters is command, event, and then state. So here we're going to use the built-in or set because the state of our event source behavior is one of these CRDTs. The events are the operations which act on that CRDT. The event handler is just a call to apply operation on the or set. Now let's have a look at the command handler. All we do in the command handler is translate our incoming commands, such as add movie and remove movie, into operations on the or set. When we call methods on the or set, rather than like a regular Java or Scala set, where it would return a modified version of that set, or if it was mutable, modify the set, it returns the operations. That operation, which is our event type in this event source behavior, is what will be replicated. There is nothing specific to replicated event sourcing in this implementation. This implementation would work both with regular event sourcing and also with replicated event sourcing. Ideally, when using replicated event sourcing, you can make your data model convergent. However, there are cases where you might want to do a reconciliation action. Let's take the example of modeling a bank account with an event source behavior. When it comes to making deposits into the bank, there is no conflict. We always want people to be able to put as much money in the bank as possible. However, we might have some business rules to say that a bank account shouldn't be overdrawn. Now, if we have two concurrent events, which are withdrawals at two replicas, we might end up allowing the user to take too much money out of their bank account. And that's because the business logic to, to see whether this withdrawal is valid passes on both sides before the events are replicated. And in this case, we both allow a minus four and a minus nine and then once those events have replicated, we end up with a negative bank balance. And you have to decide for your business use case whether this is something you want to allow at the cost of having to fix these issues with a reconciliation action. I know for a fact that the bank I use will allow me to go more overdrawn even than my arranged overdraft, and it will charge me because of this. When using replicated event sourcing, you can detect that this has happened after the fact. For the bank account example, we're not going to use any built-in CRDTs. We're going to design our own data structure for it. For commands, we have deposit, withdraw, and get balance. We've also got this private command called alert over withdrawn, which we'll look at in just a moment. And then for the events, we have corresponding events for deposited, withdrawn, and overdrawn. The state class simply pattern matches on the operation and then updates the balance. The event source behavior for this is similar to the previous one. We don't need to construct our persistence ID. Our replication context will create that. And we get our replication context from this factory method. We start off with a state of zero, and then we've got our command handler and our event handler. The command handler translates between commands and events and executes some business logic. For deposits, we always directly translate them into deposited events. We never reject a deposit. However, for withdrawals, we do. We make sure that the balance minus the amount is greater than zero. If that's the case, then we persist the withdrawal event and then respond to say that we've done so. Otherwise, we reject this command and we respond with insufficient funds. Because we can have multiple replicas, we can't rely on the balance never going below zero. And that's because two different replicas could both be checking the balance at the same time and making a withdrawal. This is where we want to detect this and run a reconciliation action. We do that in the event handler. The event handler does the normal business logic where it applies the operation, which either withdraws or deposits money based on the type of event, but it also detects that this edge case where there were concurrent withdrawals. Let's have a look at that now. The first and most useful bit of information is whether the event that's currently being processed is a concurrent one. Under the covers, this is detected using a version vector. The next bit of information we get is what is the current replica? Because in certain cases, if we want to execute certain side effects, we might only want to do those once. 
so we only do them inside a single replica. Here, rather than availability, we're picking consistency. We now know that this piece of functionality won't execute if the data center where the replica is, replica is running is down. But this is because we only want this to happen once and we don't want to have it inconsistent. And finally, the replication context can tell us if a recovery is running. Because this, this with detect overdrawn is called from the event handler, we probably don't want to execute it if the event is being recovered because we've restarted the event source behavior. So given all of those conditions match, then we check whether the balance has gone below zero. And if it has, we trigger a command saying to it that we would need to alert overdrawn. This command gets turned into an event, which can either be acted on right away, or you could look at it inside a projection. Hopefully this gives you some ideas of rather than having downtime because you need things to be consistent across data centers, you can actually let certain things happen and then reconcile them later. Another common use case when using replicated event sourcing is having a variable level of consistency. An example of this is an e-commerce application. You might want ultimate uptime for allowing users to modify their baskets or modify what they're buying. But when it comes to checkout, you want to enforce a higher level of consistency. Another example is an auction like eBay, where you always want to be available for bids because you want as much business as possible. But when it comes to declaring the winner, we really want to make sure that both replicas or all replicas in all data centers have finished and all of the bids have been seen. Otherwise, we might end up declaring the wrong winner. This is the most complicated sample and it models a technique where we keep extra information in the state to see which replicas have seen a certain piece of information. We do that by storing a phase inside the state and one of those phases keeps track of the fact of which replicas have seen that we're in a certain state. For the auction phase, we start off with running and that's where we're still accepting bids at all replicas. At that point, we want availability. We always want to accept bids. An auction ends at a particular time, but of course clocks run differently in different data centers at different replicas, so they might close at slightly different times. To model that, we go through a closing phase where we keep track of the replicas that have reported that they've finished accepting bids. And then finally, we moved into a closed state, which means that one particular replica has seen that all other replicas have, have had the auction finish and it declares the winning bid. We'll start off by looking at the command handler. The command handler first checks the phase. If the phase is running, then we accept bids. We also accept queries for get highest bid. And then we also handle the finish. The finish turns into an auction finished event. And it's that event which allows us to know that this replica knows that the auction has finished. The finish command gets scheduled when this actor starts up. So we do inside after recovery is complete, we start a timer for when the auction should be finished and we send ourselves a finish message. We're not going to look too much into the rest of the command handler. You can go and look at that in your own time. The next part of the puzzle is inside the auction state. So in the normal case, we're just accepting bids, but for this finish logic, we first check if we're in the running state. If so, we transition into the closing state and set ourself has have seen the fact that the auction has finished. Alternatively, if we're already in the closing state, then this auction finished event is from a different replica. So we save that fact. We take the existing DCs that we already know have finished and we add this new data center to it. Similar to the previous example, example, we then trigger something to happen after the event handler is processed. The event triggers function only has triggers for the auction finished event. And then what it does is it checks whether it should be the replica that's responsible for closing the auction finally and declaring the winning bid. The should close function checks whether this is the replica that is responsible for closing. And what we do here is we elect a single replica to do this. So for this bit of behavior of our application, we're picking consistency over availability. If the DC or replica is down that is responsible for closing, the auction will end because all of the up DCs will finish, but we won't declare the winning bid until the DC that's responsible for declaring the winning bid is back up and returns true if that's the case. 
And if that's the case, we send ourselves the close message. This then goes back into the command handler and the command handler, it persists a winner decided, knowing that every single replica has persisted all of the bids that it's received. There's quite a lot going on in that example, but I hope it gives you an idea of how you can model things in your state to achieve a higher level of consistency when it's important. That concludes all of the examples. I hope they give you some insight into how you can do data modeling for active-active event sourcing.